In the case of the Khufu ship, they've used some kind of plied vegetable fiber rope. The thing they share is that they have thick sculpted planks which are tied or lashed or sewn together. Now, it looks a very unlikely technique to us today, but it clearly worked. There is often a great debate about how artifacts of African origin and African cultural motifs show up all over the world from ancient times right up to the colonial era. In truth, it is not a mystery that Africans were able to navigate the globe. Archaeologists have known this for centuries. But as with many elements of history from the continent, it hasn't made it to our history books. Once you realize how skilled Africans were at boat building and navigation, you will understand that it is the puzzle piece that ties the evidence with the missing narrative of history that we will cover today. From the Dufuna boat built in Mali 8,000 years ago to the various boat reliefs shown in all over ancient Sahara, to the similarities in boat building techniques from Senegal to Kemet to Sumer and ancient Davidian civilization, to the ancient sailboat technologies found all over the continent, to the swimming and surfing expertise shown by pre-colonial African nations. As we go through this study, please keep this in mind. Showing that Africans were at the origin of some of the most significant advances in boat building technology following the civilization reset of the younger Dryas, we are not saying that other people were not able to do the same. It does, however, fill the historical gap from our current perspective of history and also helps us understand the rapid dispersal of technologies originating in Africa towards the rest of the world. There is so much evidence on this subject that I will leave a ton of sources in the video description. There is an ancient water deity in Central and West Africa that is called Mamiwata. She is depicted as a perfect Cyrene beauty who comes out of the sea and challenges the hearts of men. Those who are lucky enough to win her favor will gain riches untold. Black people today have all lost their way and have become undeserving of Mamiwata. But by regaining the knowledge of generations past, we will one day be again in her favor. We will also address the burning question of African technology absence in recent times. If Africans had so much technology and ancient shipbuilding know-how in antiquity, how come Africa is lagging behind today in maritime presence? But for now, let us go back. Back to a time when traveling by water enabled humans to have a far more connected globe than we suspect today. And we will see how, since the Africans discovered that they could walk on water, it has propelled human growth and gene dispersal. At the turn of the 17th century, Dutch explorer Pieter de Marais gave his observation of West African swimmers, writing, quote, They are very fast swimmers and can keep themselves underwater for a long time. They can dive amazingly far, no less deep, and can see underwater, because they are so good at swimming and diving." End quote. Just like the myth of the black man without civilization, the popularized ideas of black people's inability to swim and to navigate the seas is turned on its head when we look at the actual historical record. From technically elaborate seaworthy sailboats copied in style and engineering by the Europeans, to their superhuman diving abilities, to the abundance of archaeological evidence showing up all over the world attesting to Africans' pre-colonial, extensive maritime culture, black Africans had a love story with water. A relationship that is making a comeback now that the second awakening of the black man and the black woman is afoot. Freedom is not something that one people can bestow on another as a gift.
The sport culture historian Richard Mandel contends that during the colonial period, most Westerners could not swim, but if they learned to swim at all, it was the dog paddle to save themselves in an emergency. Travel accounts suggest that some whites used variants of the breaststroke, in which both arms are extended forward and pulled back together in a sweeping circular motion, while the legs are thrust out and pulled together in circular frog kicks. Yet, the breaststroke is only slightly more advanced than the dog paddle. In the 16th century, European theorists began publishing treatises on swimming. Most advocated versions of the breaststroke, while excluding discussions of the stroke now known as the freestyle, Australian crawl or crawl. Importantly, swimming theories targeted literate nobility and gentry largely evolved as analytical speculation concerned with developing ideal forms of swimming, these theories were constructed apart from swimmers and thus had little influence on contemporary swimming practices. Conversely, coastal and interior Atlantic Africans, as well as Native Americans and Asians, used variants of the freestyle, enabling Africans to incorporate swimming into many daily activities. With alternate overarm strokes combined with fast scissor kicks, the freestyle is the strongest and swiftest swimming style. In 1455, the Venetian merchant adventurer Alvise de Cadamosto wrote that Africans living along the Senegal River are the most expert swimmers in the world. In the late 16th century, after Flemish adventurer Pieter de Marais commented on Gold Coast Africans' freestyle technique. He wrote, they can swim very fast, generally easily outdoing people of our nation in swimming and diving. On September 5, 1942, United States Navy messman Charles Jackson French swam through the night for six to eight hours, pulling a raft of 15 wounded sailors with a rope tied around his waist through shark-infested waters. The U.S. Navy ship USS Gregory had been struck by Japanese naval fire in the South Pacific, resulting in many casualties. Despite the perilous conditions, French successfully brought the injured men to safety on the shores of the Solomon Islands. In 1943, French became the first black swimmer to earn the Navy Medal for his heroism. Early European observers, like Michael Hemerson, and Jean Barbeau recorded seeing African children using boards to surf waves. Later accounts by James Edward Alexander and Thomas J. Hutchinson provided detailed descriptions of African surfing practices. In the 1966 surfing documentary Endless Summer, director and narrator Bruce Brown claimed that surfers Patrick O'Connell and Robert August introduced surfing to Africa after they taught several children to surf to the west of Accra, Ghana. Yet, accounts indicate that Africans in Senegal, Ghana, Cameroon, and possibly West Central Africa had been surfing long before European contact. The swimming abilities of several disparate ethnic groups were so strong that they were able to invent surfing independent of Polynesian influence and probably without influencing each other. Surfing was invented independently in Polynesia, Peru, and parts of Atlantic Africa. Today, people surf while standing, but as the anthropologist Ben Finney explains, in traditional surfing, it was possible to surf in a prone, kneeling, sitting, or standing position. According to Finney, pre-Columbian fishermen in northern Peru surfed on reed bundles that came to be known as cabalitos, or little horses. These fishermen propelled their cabalitos with wooden paddles while in a sitting position. Even in Hawaii, where surfing and surf culture became most developed, sources indicate that many early modern Hawaiians surfed in sitting, kneeling, and prone positions. In fact, notice this painting of the 1884 Nile expedition that the Africans are shown swimming in what seems to be relatively strong current using the freestyle technique to cross the Nile. 
recognizing the superior capabilities of many people of African descent, some whites advocated their use as lifeguards. In 1804, while Dr. George Pinkard was in Barbados, he wrote that African swimming expertise renders the Negroes peculiarly useful in moments of distress, such as in cases of accident at sea or in the harbor. Canoeman's strong swimming abilities and Westerners' relative inability forced many Europeans to respect Canoeman in ways that cut across widely accepted views concerning race. Prudent Europeans realized that their lives could be dependent on Canoeman's swimming abilities. It was unwise to express racist sentiments towards Canoeman, or otherwise to insult them. As always, our sources will be in the video description. You can find various ways to support Without History in the description. My undying gratitude to all my supporters, and support can come in many forms. From sharing the video with a family member or student, to becoming a member on Patreon. Beyond their swimming prowess, the Africans had a millennia-long tradition of boat building that evolved until the 19th century, just like this boat that was recently discovered. It was so old that it shocked the history community. On the 4th of May, 1987, Malam Yau, a Fulani cowherdsman from northern Nigeria, was digging a well and hit a hard object at 4.5 meters. He informed his village chief about the discovery. He didn't know it at the time, but he had found one of the oldest boat building remains in history. It was named the Dafuma Canoe, after the northern Nigerian village where it was found. A few years later, in 1989 and 1990, the University of Maiduguri in Mali carried out an initial exploration of the site to ascertain whether it was a canoe as well. Take radiocarbon dating samples of the wood, Later, a joint research project by professors Peter Breunig and Garba Abubakar, funded by the University of Frankfurt and the University of Maiduguri, would return to the site, and further wood samples were taken and dated by two German laboratories. In 1994, an archaeology team from Germany and Nigeria excavated the site. The canoe was dug out over two weeks by 50 laborers and was found to be 28 feet in length, 1.6 feet wide, and 5 centimeters thick. The canoe was found in a waterlogged state resting on a sandy bed with layers of clay between it and the surface, protecting it in an oxygen-free environment. Examination of the canoe showed that the bow and stern had been skillfully worked to points and that the work was carried out by core axe-like and pickaxe bifacial tools of microlithic appearance. Professor Brunig said that the skill of construction showed a long development and that the canoe was not a new design. In another study by an American science team in 2015, they found that Lake Chad had shrunk by 95% in 40 years, and therefore it could be assumed that area of the village of Dufuna would have been part of the lake's floodplain in the distant past. And this was confirmed by the following studies. The canoe was radiocarbon dated at least twice and was dated to 6500 BCE. It was probably created in a long-standing boat-making tradition and used in fishing along the Komadugu Ghana River. It may have been constructed by members of a population group who occupied an area extending from the Western Sahara to the Nile of Central Sudan and to Northern Kenya. The canoe was radiocarbon dated at least twice and was dated to 6500 BCE. It was probably created in a long-standing boat-making tradition and used in fishing along the Komadugu Ghana River. It may have been constructed by members of a population group who occupied an area extending from the Western Sahara to the Nile of Central Sudan and to Northern Kenya. This boat building tradition continued to evolve in many vectors and evolved into sailboats in Kemet 
and industrial level boat building in Carthage. A millennia after the Dufuna boat, the black Africans in Mesopotamia started building reed boats. These were very sophisticated builds combining elements available from their environment and binding agents to ensure sturdiness. When they were analyzed, they revealed something very interesting. Archaeological remains show that Africans may have been traveling by boats far longer than they would have in other areas of the world. Ancient maps of Africa shows that the continent was very wet. There are numerous depictions of boats on rock carvings in ancient Africa. It's interesting to note that for the longest time in human history, you could travel from South Africa to ancient Sahara by boat, and you could cross the Sahara from west to east with the river network reported by Herodotus himself. Note that this is relatively recent in human history. On pottery in pre-dynastic Kemet and Nubia, we can see depictions of boats and sailboats. These pre-dynastic vases show the variety of African boats that existed between 5000 and 4000 BC. And we are here in a period between 3500 and 4000 BC, which means that sailboats have existed in African technology for very long. In the depictions of the famous voyage of Queen Hatshepsut to Punt, we can see that her boat already had sails and 60 oars. Also, we know that expeditions to the land of Punt dated back to the early kingdom. Although we do not have depictions of their modes of transportation, it is safe to assume that since the Africans from ancient Egypt had sailboats from the pre-dynastic period, that they also used them for their early expeditions to Punt. And they also would have used them to travel throughout the Sahara when the rivers still allowed it. If you haven't seen this relief from her expedition to Punt, I highly recommend you seek it out. The story it tells and the details are just amazing. It show everything from the type of fish that lived in the Nile to the type of goods that they brought back. They were even able to load cattle and trees onto the sailboats. Since reed boat technology existed in West Africa, ancient Sahara, Kemet, Sumeria, and the early Dravidian cultures, they happened to share the same names. The Dravidian name for boat in the Indus Valley is Kalan. The Sumerian name for boat is Kalam. The Manda name of boat is Kulu. Manda is the West African group from which Mansa Musa, the richest man in history, came, and Mansa Musa happens to be the cousin of the other Mansa who traveled to the Americas with an armada across the Atlantic, never to return. Why is this of significance? Because we have already shown in previous videos that it was the Africans who spread their technology and know-how to the rest of the world, and that the evidence was overwhelming from genetics to religion to language, writing, culture, and mathematics. This evidence here shows that it may have been through maritime travels that they would have done it. In Tablet 11 of the Epic of Gilgamesh, Utnapishtim, the Sumerian equivalent of Noah, gives detailed instructions on building his boat to survive the Great Flood. The text mentions using bitumen, which was commonly used to waterproof reed boats. While the specific material of the boat is not always explicitly stated, the context suggests it aligns with the traditional reed boats of Mesopotamia, which were coated with bitumen for waterproofing. So then, let us look at what made the reed boats from Mesopotamia so special. Reed boats from the Ubaid period were primarily discovered in the marshlands of southern Mesopotamia, particularly in regions corresponding to modern-day Iraq. Archaeological excavations have unearthed remnants of these boats alongside settlements and other artifacts, providing a glimpse into the early use of waterways for transportation and trade. There are multiple depictions of reed boats like this one from the Mesopotamia era. One notable discovery includes the remnants of reed boats found in the archaeological site of Eridu, one of the oldest known cities in Mesopotamia, Excavations led by archaeologists like Fuad Safar and Seton Lloyd in the mid-20th century brought to light these early watercraft. 
The primary material used in constructing these ancient boats was reed, a plant abundantly available in the marshes of southern Mesopotamia. Reeds were bound together using ropes made from other plant fibers to create a buoyant and flexible structure. Reed bundles were lashed together to form the hull of the boat. The exterior was often coated with bitumen, a naturally occurring tar-like substance, to waterproof the vessel and ensure its durability in water. This method of construction provided a lightweight yet sturdy means of navigating the waterways. The use of bitumen for waterproofing was a significant innovation, allowing the reed boats to be used for extended periods and in various water conditions. The design of these boats was well suited to the shallow and calm waters of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, facilitating the transport of goods and people. The reed boats featured a simple yet effective design, with a flat bottom and a rounded hull, making them stable and easy to maneuver. The construction technique involved layering and tightly binding the reeds, which provided flexibility and resilience against potential damage. In fact, there were two successful expeditions to cross the Atlantic using boat building technology from the Africans in Kemet and Mesopotamia. They both used reed boats. The first was the Raw 2 expedition in 1970. Thor Heyerdahl, a Norwegian ethnographer, successfully crossed the Atlantic Ocean using a reed boat named Raw 2. Constructed from papyrus, Raw 2 set sail from Morocco and arrived in Barbados after a 57-day journey covering approximately 4,000 miles. This expedition demonstrated that ancient seafaring using reed boats was feasible across the Atlantic. The second was the Abra 3 expedition. Inspired by Heyerdahl, German scientist Dominique Gorlitz led several expeditions using reed boats named Abra. In 2007, Abra III set out to demonstrate the possibility of intercontinental sea journeys with ancient technology, though it faced challenges similar to Heyerdahl's first attempt. So if they could cross the choppy waters of the Atlantic, they could definitely sail across the calm Mediterranean and venture into the Indian Ocean. And they sure did, as we saw in previous episodes of Without History, the emergence of Mesoamerican mother culture cannot be explained but with injection of people, culture, writing, architecture, even down to pyramid-building technique and golden face masks for their kings. The ancient Egyptians continued the boat-building tradition as they started with reed boats and evolved into wooden sailboats within a millennia. The oldest Nubio-Kemetic, ancient Egyptian boats, date back to 4000 BC. They were uncovered during archaeological excavations in the Fayum region, a fertile area west of the Nile River in Egypt. These boats were found alongside other artifacts that indicated a settled and thriving community. The Fayum boats were primarily constructed from bundles of reeds, a readily available material in the marshy environment of the Nile Delta. These reed boats were likely coated with bitumen to make them waterproof. The use of reeds demonstrates early Egyptians' resourcefulness in utilizing local materials to construct functional watercraft. As we have seen, the reed construction technique exemplifies a significant innovation in early boat building. The reeds were tightly bound together to form a buoyant and flexible structure, allowing the boats to navigate the shallow and marshy waters effectively. This method laid the groundwork for more advanced shipbuilding techniques. Hierakonpolis, one of the most important prehistoric urban centers in Egypt, has yielded numerous archaeological finds, including boats. These boats were discovered in burial sites, suggesting their importance in funerary practices and beliefs about the afterlife. The boats from Hierakonpolis were made from wood, a significant advancement from the reed boats of the Fayum Oasis. The use of wooden planks and the mortise and tenon technique for joining them indicate an early understanding of carpentry and boat building principles. Khufu's solar bark was discovered in 1954 in a sealed pit at the base of the Great Pyramid of Giza. The boat was dismantled into 1,224 pieces and buried to accompany Pharaoh Khufu in the afterlife, reflecting the Egyptian belief in the journey of the soul. Khufu's boat was constructed from Lebanese cedar wood, chosen for its durability and resistance to decay. 
The boat measures about 43.6 meters in length and was built using the shell-first construction method, where the outer planks were assembled before the internal framework was added. So now armed with seaworthy ships, the Africans were able to brave the seas where they faced a new challenge. The history of maritime and ancient maritime trade between civilizations dates back to thousands of years. An important marine trade route during this era was the Arabian Sea, where the coastal sailing vessels began to make an appearance. Different vessels were used for both coastal fishing and traveling. In 3000 BC, due to the fact that Egypt was a coastal country, having both the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, as routes connecting the country with other lands and cultures, ancient Egyptians were pioneers in shipbuilding, and they were becoming more experienced in navigating the lands around them and conducting various forms of expeditions and trades. The ancient Egyptians used to assemble wooden planks into a hull. They lashed the planks together using woven straps, and they used reeds or grass as a stuffing between the planks to help seal the seams. The first reference made referring to a ship by that term, ship, was Sneferu's ancient cedarwood ship, which was called Praise of the Two Lands. Reference to this ship was recorded in 2613 BC. It is also known that Egyptians had trade routes reaching the land of Punt, from which they imported spices and other valuable goods. This steady trade network existed all the way into the classical era. Agatharchides, the Greek historian and geographer wrote about the ancient Egyptians' shipfaring. He said, During the prosperous period of the Old Kingdom, between the 30th and 25th centuries BC, the river routes were kept in order, and Egyptian ships sailed the Red Sea as far as the Mer country. In ancient Egypt, the first warships were constructed during the early Middle Kingdom, and maybe even at the end of the Old Kingdom. However, the first mention of a large, heavily armed ship was in the 16th century BC, which is found in a text on the tomb of Amenhotep I. The text describes in detail the nature of those warships, saying, And I ordered to build twelve warships with rams, dedicated to Amun or Sobek or Mat and Sekhmet, whose image was crowned best bronze noses. Carport and equipped outside rook over the waters for many paddlers, having covered rowers' deck not only from the side, but in top. And they were on board eighteen oars in two rows on the top, and sat on two rowers, and the lower one a hundred and eight rowers were. And twelve rowers aft worked on three steering oars, and blocked our majesty ship inside three partitions, bulkheads, so as not to drown it by ramming the wicked, and the sailors had time to repair the hole. And our majesty arranged four towers for archers, two behind, and two on the nose and one above the other small, on the mast with narrow loopholes. They are covered with bronze in the fifth finger, 3.2 mm, as well as a canopy roof and its rowers, and they have carried on the nose three assault heavy crossbow arrows, so they lit resin or oil with a salt of seth, probably nitrate, tore a special blend and punched lead ball with a lot of holes, and one of the same at the stern and long ship seventy-five cubits, forty-one e.m., and the breadth sixteen, and in battle can go three-quarters of Iteru per hour, about 6.5 knots. History also records that the ancient land of Nubia and the kingdom of Aksum used to trade with India since evidence was found indicating that ships from northeast Africa sailed back and forth between India and Nubia trading goods. Some evidence even says that their sea voyages also reached Persia, Himyar, and Rome. Moreover, the Greeks knew the Oxum to have seaports for their ships from both Greece and Yemen. The Periplus of the Red Sea, also known as the Periplus of the Erythrean Sea, is a manuscript that describes ports, landmarks, navigation, and trading opportunities from Roman Egyptian ports along the Red Sea coast, the Horn of Africa, the Sindh region of Pakistan, and the southwestern regions of India. This manuscript reports that Somalis were trading frankincense, along with other items through their northern ports such as Berbera and Zela, with the people of the Arabian Peninsula long before the arrival of Islam in the region. 
They also used to trade with Egypt, which at the time was Roman controlled. The Somali sailors transported their cargo using the ancient Somali vessel known as the Baden or the Baden Safar. Furthermore, the Swahili people from East Africa had several extensive trading ports lining the coast of ancient East Africa. Zimbabwe alone had extensive trading posts with Central Africa and used to import goods through the Southeast African shore trade of Kilwa, the present-day Tanzania. The first to make a complete sail around Africa were the Phoenicians, creating the beginning of the modern field of geography. A quick note here to clarify that these civilizations which ship building know-how we covered, these civilizations from Carthage to Phoenicia and Kemet, were undeniably black, as we have covered in previous episodes. Also, during the Carthaginian civilization, where the city of Carthage, in the present-day Tunisia, was the center of that civilization, the Carthaginians were well known for their advanced seafaring skills and their innovation in designing ships. Their unique hull shape provided enhanced speed and stability, with sharper prows and broader sterns for better maneuverability. The Carthaginians pioneered the use of the quinquireme, a galley with five rowers per bench, offering greater speed and power in naval battles. Utilizing sophisticated construction techniques like mortise and tenon joints and high-quality timber from North Africa and Spain, their ships were both durable and resilient. Equipped with both sails and oars, Carthaginian vessels could harness wind power while maintaining reliability in various sea conditions. Carthage had such an industry that they could produce up to 200 ships within the matter of one month. This would prove very useful in the upcoming war against Rome. In fact, when Romans were lucky enough to retrieve a Carthaginian ship that had run aground, they quickly realized that the Carthaginians had shipbuilding techniques that involved labeling of each part, which implied that different sections of the ship were manufactured by specialists and then brought together and assembled using a template, a true precursor to modern engineering of the Industrial Age. It is this industry that was supporting Hannibal in his efforts against Rome as he was making his way across the Alps. This ancient expertise in boat building carried through all the way to the pre-colonial era all over Africa, with ships so capable that the Europeans borrowed their designs to allow them to navigate the open sea and the first designs they borrowed came from this region. Perhaps the best way to illustrate the level that West and Central Africans had in way of seaworthy ships is to look at this engraving from the notable Dutch poet and engraver Jan Leuken. It depicts Congolese pirates raiding a European ship off the coast of what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. As this was not an isolated incident, its implications tell us that the narrative of that period in time is not as we perceive it today. When Europeans were looking for captured labor in Africa, they also launched a campaign to discredit any African scientific and technological achievement. The objective was to dehumanize the black man in order to make it easier for the general population to accept the mistreatment of these very Africans. These strategies exist until today, and they range from reappropriating or denying that certain civilizations were black African to seeking technologies that the Africans had without giving the Africans credit. Because of this, we can't really retrace all the technology and knowledge that the Portuguese Spanish, French, and British got from West Africa, but we can infer it from the various maritime traditions that existed in the 15th and 16th century when the Europeans arrived. The crew from the West African coast were one of these nations that excelled at shipbuilding and deep sea navigation. The crew people, indigenous to the coastal regions of modern-day Liberia and Côte d'Ivoire, are historically renowned for their exceptional maritime skills and shipbuilding expertise. Their coastal location naturally fostered a deep connection with the ocean, which became central to their culture and economy. The crew were master navigators, adept at fishing and trading along the West African coast. 
they constructed and piloted canoes and larger vessels that could withstand the turbulent Atlantic waters, allowing them to engage in extensive trade of goods like salt, palm oil, and other local resources. The crew's shipbuilding prowess was particularly advanced. They built sturdy, seaworthy vessels capable of long voyages and heavy loads. Their canoes, often carved from single tree trunks, were designed for speed and stability, essential for both fishing and trade. Larger boats, equipped with outriggers, enabled safer navigation in deeper waters and facilitated longer-distance trade missions. This technological advantage allowed the crew to dominate local and regional maritime trade networks, establishing and maintaining economic ties with other coastal and inland communities. Well then, if Africans were so good at open sea navigation before the arrival of Europeans, then there must be some evidence of this on the other side of the Atlantic. There is lots of it. Could you find a corroboration of so much evidence? Stoneheads representing a distinct physical type, terracottas representing the same type with the texture of hair and coloration of skin, and skeletal evidence representing that type as high as 13.5% at Tlatilco going down to 4.5% at Monte Alban. And you yet deny the existence of that type because it involved African and it could not be there. In 1493, when Columbus arrived on the coast of present-day Dominican Republic, the locals sported spears that looked similar to the ones he had seen in his trips to Guinea. When asked, the native told them that they had acquired them from men that came from the southeast and that these black men came by boat. Incidentally, they called the metal atop those spears guanin, which happens to be the same name that the West Africans gave to their metal. When Columbus had one of the spears sent to Spain for testing, it was discovered that their composition was identical, not similar but identical to the spears made in West Africa. Sources from the early 16th century document Central African naval vessels carved from single logs, capable of carrying 150 people. In the 16th century, Congo was recorded to deploy 800 such vessels. In 1525, one of these boats cooperated with a Portuguese vessel to capture a French ship off the coast of Soyo, playing a key role in the capture and attack. One of the earliest accounts of boats with sails comes from Duarte Lopez, who lived in the Congo Kingdom from 1578 to 1597. He described Congo natives using sailboats made from the trunks of palm trees, equipped with prows, sterns, oars and sails, used for fishing and sailing to the mainland. The love story that the African had with water is only absent in history because of its active denial and the disappearance of that skill set in recent history is only brought about by the crime of colonization and active economic sabotage of the black economy wherever he lives. Just like many of the historical accounts about Africa, the true story of the African's contribution to shipbuilding and navigation has been suppressed. In part, this was made so in order to ensure that the picture of an African south of the Sahara that didn't interact with the rest of the world, that this picture would support the narrative that those who started civilization itself would be written out of it. A lie that was started for historical reasons, maintained for convenience, and has now become, generations later, accepted knowledge by the masses who do not have the time to research the truth. The evidence is not just in the African's ability to build boats, but also in circumstances that can only be explained if a transatlantic exchange existed well before Columbus. From the ancient presence of corn, cassava, and sweet potatoes in Western Africa, to the similarities in cultural practices, similarities in civilization pillars, and similarities in language between Mesoamerica and West Africa. And now that we have brought down the sale of this lie, it is now up to you all to set the new cap for our future, a future that is knowledgeable, a future that is aware, and a future that ensures that all who need to know gain access to this gift. Because the gift of knowledge is the true gift of freedom.
If you are still here, don't forget to hit the like button. It really helps. And if you are looking for ways to support me in my work, you can find the links below. But the best support is to leave a comment about what you learned and to share it with those who need to know.